Chapter 6, Early Development. One of the important things that we're going to cover in this chapter are some of the basic processes that occur in the formation of head and neck structures, including the teeth. In fact, we are going to see some processes that get repeated over and over and over, just tweaked a little bit each time, as if the human body has one set of instructions that it modifies for 10 different recipes. And then in the rest of this lecture, we'll cover the first few weeks of development where we make really big structures like the nervous system and the heart. Let's start with some basic definitions. Embryology is the study of everything that happens before birth, including the embryonic and the fetal periods. Those periods can be lumped together, and we would say that is the prenatal period. The first third of that is the first trimester. That's the embryonic period. After this, we would say that that organism is now a fetus, and it will go through the second and third trimester. Most of the interesting stuff that we're going to be learning about, including formation of the teeth, is happening here within the first trimester. So think about that for a moment. Think about relatively when, if you were deciding when to make stuff, when would you make the circulatory system, the nervous system, the skeleton? When would you make the teeth? When would you make fingers and toes and a liver and a spleen? And I think the relative order of some of those things might surprise you. We're going to be covering a number of congenital malformations, which used to be called birth defects, but it's generally not considered to be good practice anymore to call any of your patients defective. So we've got new terminology for this. But congenital disorders or malformations might be caused by teratogens. These are chemicals that can be found within our environment. And when I say chemical, I don't necessarily mean things that are created artificially in some sort of chemistry lab at some big company. These chemicals might be coming from plants or food sources. Nevertheless, we say they are environmental. They're coming from outside the human body and they often mimic or block some of the chemicals that are found inside the human body that guide the processes of development, such as processes like put a tooth here, but leave a little space and then put another tooth over here. So teratogens, once again, and I'll repeat this just because it's important, are chemicals that often mimic those chemical signals or chemicals that block the chemical signals that are used by developing embryos. One of the most famous is the medication thalidomide, which was given to women in Europe to try and alleviate their complaints about morning sickness. And there's a whole bunch of politics in there that I don't want to get into. But the big issue here was that this chemical interfered with the formation of the limbs. And therefore, when women were pregnant and taking thalidomide at the right time, their children were much more likely to born with severely small or even absent arms and legs. Next up, some congenital malformations can be caused by genetics. They are passed down from generation to generation. For instance, polydactyly, having an extra digit on the hands or feet can be inherited from one's parents, as can many forms of dwarfism. Some congenital malformations are caused by a lack of the proper chemicals or a nutritional deficiency. One of the most common ones that we still worry about today is a deficiency in the vitamin folic acid. This vitamin is necessary for the closure of the neural tube and low levels of this vitamin during development may lead to spina bifida. 
by the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer this question. When would a pregnant female need to start supplementing with folic acid to ensure that there's enough of this chemical in her body to allow for the closure of the neural tube and prevent having a child born with spina bifida? Lastly, a lot of congenital malformations are still a mystery to us. And so we lump them into this category of iatrogenic, or we don't know what the cause was. We will cover some that are important in dental hygiene. Next, let's cover some of the processes that we're going to be seeing over and over and over again. The first is patterning. As this embryo develops, it needs to develop some new shapes or patterns. So to become a fetus from an embryo, you're going to need a lot more cells. You're going to need different cells. Those cells need to be in the right places and at the right times. This is going to require a lot of coordination. Over here to the right, I've shown you a picture of the sun. And damn it, I'm an embryologist, not an astronomer. When I look at this picture, I can't tell whether it's right side up or turned a little bit clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's because simply looking at the sun, I can't tell where its top or its bottom or its left or its right is. It just looks like a big sphere to me. And that's kind of amazing because I see this thing every single day, or at least I would if I didn't live in Oregon and it was obscured by clouds most of the time. But nevertheless, Looking at it, I can't really tell if it has a top or a bottom or a left or a right. And maybe my friend, the astronomy instructor, would be very disappointed in me that I'm not certain whether the sun has a north pole and a south pole. I suspect it does, but that's not something I would really like to gamble on. An early embryo is going to be very similar. It's not going to have a distinctive top or bottom or left or right. Looking at it, we're not going to be able to see any signs that it has any pattern to it whatsoever, other than it's a big blob of cells. But at some point, one side of the embryo has to become the head, and the exact opposite side has to become the tail. Not two tails, not two heads, but one of each. And that, conceptually, is actually a pretty important process. How do we go from nothing to something? Later, we're going to see that as long as you have something, it's relatively easier to get a little bit more. But to go from zero to one, that's a much bigger step than from one to two or from two to three. Next, let me just talk about another reason why patterning is so complicated. When cells undergo mitosis, they make exact copies of one another. And all of my cells, even in adulthood, have the exact same DNA. Yeah, maybe a few have some mutations and uh, my blood cells are a little bit special, but everybody else has all of the information that they need to form the head. And yet only some of the cells in my body actually formed my head. So how did those cells decide to form the head and communicate that that's what they were going to do so that none of the other cells in other parts of the body tried to do the same thing? The reason that that can happen is because of the next process, which is induction. Cells can be induced, or another way of saying that is they can be instructed to use their DNA differently. Remember, once again, all cells have the exact same DNA. The reason that my body looks different in different places is because cells in different places use that DNA differently. They've been induced to express some genes, but not others. So the process of induction is when cells are instructed on when and where to use their DNA and what parts of that DNA. 
The process of induction can occur over different distances, which we could roughly categorize as short range, medium range, and long range. For instance, the shortest range possible is direct contact. One example would be a cell containing a protein in its plasma membrane coming into direct contact with other cells that have receptors for that protein on their cell surface. The binding of the membrane protein to the receptors could trigger changes in DNA expression, leading to those target cells looking and acting differently. The signal protein doesn't have to be on a cell. It could be within the extracellular matrix, for instance, being a part of fibronectin. Target cells coming into contact with that signal could be induced to change. Frequently in this course, we're going to see those signals secreted into the extracellular matrix where they diffuse a short distance away. When they do so, they will create a concentration gradient, meaning there will be high levels of that signal close to the cell secreting it, and there will be lower levels as you get further away. So the target cells that are closest may receive a high level of that signal. Some other cells that are a little bit further away may get low levels of that signal, and other cells in the body may receive even lower levels of that signal, low enough to be effectively zero. Those signals we call morphogens. Remember, to morph means to change shape. So these are chemical signals secreted by one cell that will cause other cells to change in appearance. The third distance that we might talk about are hormones, which act over long distances. If you get a circulatory system, chemical signals could be dumped into the circulatory system and distributed throughout the entire body in equal amounts. This is important for orchestrating the growth of the entire organism. One example would be growth hormone. When growth hormone is secreted into the bloodstream, all of the body receives the same level of growth hormone, and therefore both arms grow at the same speed and both legs grow at the same speed. And in fact, uh, something interesting happens. The arms grow at the same speed that leads to the uh, wingspan between fingertip to fingertip to be exactly equal to the height of that person. Everybody's a different height, but we all share that same ratio. And that's thanks to all parts of the body receiving the same amount of growth hormone and then growing at relatively the same rate. But now to reiterate, we're going to be seeing a number of morphogens, proteins secreted into the extracellular fluid, which is fairly gelatinous, so these signaling molecules diffuse away, but not terribly fast. So we're going to see concentration gradients where the highest level of the morphogens will be close to the cell releasing them and lower levels will be found a further distance away. To get more complicated patterns, multiple morphogens interact with one another. For example, Two morphogens we will see frequently throughout the rest of this term are FGF and BMP, which stand for fibroblast growth factor and bone morphogen protein. Frequently, these morphogens will shut themselves off in neighboring cells, promoting the neighboring cells to make the other morphogen. So, we start off randomly with, say, one cell producing some FGF and the other one some BMP, which I will draw as red and blue, the red tends to shut off its own production in neighboring cells, which drives the production of the blue morphogen, and blue shuts itself off in neighboring cells, driving production of the red morphogen. 
and we'll get a pattern something like this. Okay, it's not very exciting, but we're not done yet. We still have a little tug of war going on because we've got blue cells next to blue cells and red cells next to red cells. And they're trying to shut off the production of the same morphogen in neighboring cells. So when this tug of war starts, some of the red cells will switch to blue and some blue will switch to red until a stable pattern emerges. We still have reds next to reds and blues next to blues, but this is the minimum amount possible of cells touching one another that are producing the same morphogen. And if you take a look at this, you might notice it has a striped appearance. If these were black and white stripes, you would have zebra stripes or maybe tabby cat stripes. Zebras always have stripes, but there's no genetic determination of exactly where those stripes will be. The simple production of two chemicals that shut themselves off will lead to some cells producing melanin and other cells not. Now, we're not going to be that interested in zebras or kitty cats. We will, however, be interested in patterns of alternating structures, such as tooth bud, no tooth bud, tooth bud, no tooth bud. These two signals, which can drive the stripe formation in the coats of certain animals, also drive the patterning and spacing of the teeth in vertebrate embryos. There are other patterns possible if you just tweak the amount that these two proteins interact with one another, but one very common one is this striped pattern. Next, early development has a lot of cellular proliferation, or cells divide by mitosis to make more cells and the organism grows. There's two basic ways that an organism can add more cells to itself. Those cells could be added in subsequent layers on top or below the original layer. That is called appositional growth. Other times, cells may divide from the middle and push the old cells outwards. We already saw that in the skin and the oral mucosa. Mitosis was happening in the stratum basale layer and pushing the older cells outwards. You have to be a fairly squishy tissue to be able to grow by interstitial growth. Really hard tissues like bone and enamel and dentin can only grow appositionally by adding a new layer on top of the old layer. Once the old layers are there, we can't move them around. Many epithelia, when they proliferate, will have to do something funky. If they can't push cells outwards, and yet they have to keep maintaining a sheet, they may have to fold. So if I wanted to add some cells in the middle of this epithelium here, but keep it a simple epithelium and keep all of the cells attached to one another without actually bumping the cells over here or over here, those have to stay put, then what we will find is that we need to bend this epithelium, either outwards or inwards. So there's some extra cells, and you'll notice that the simple epithelium has budded outwards or it's invaginated inwards, depending on our perspective. Outward buds form structures like our arms and legs. Inward invaginations form structures like the oral cavity and tooth buds. Sorry, but a tooth bud invaginates. Next is differentiation. We briefly covered this during the histology portion, but I want to talk about it again because it's a very important process during development. All cells contain the exact same DNA. So to get 
different types of cells in different places at different times, we have to turn on specific parts of DNA and maybe shut other parts off. And when we do that, cells often begin looking different and behaving differently. And we call that differentiation. Simply put, cells behave different from other cells. This involves changes in the transcription and translation of different genes. And then we get cells somehow looking and behaving differently. The process of differentiation may involve the short-term regulation of genes. For instance, we saw that keratinocytes could make keratin, but they don't always depending on how much stress they are under in their current location. So during differentiation, we may or may not turn on keratin if we differentiate into a, an epithelial cell. On the other hand, when a cell differentiates into an epithelial cell, it tends to permanently shut off genes that connective tissue cells would use, like the genes for collagen. And we don't just turn those off, we permanently turn them off. So those connective tissue genes would be methylated and then wrapped around histones. Conversely, a connective tissue cell might methylate the gene for keratin because it knows it's not going to make that protein and wrap that around a histone and permanently never use it again. So, Differentiation can involve the permanent shutting down of certain regions of DNA that that cell will no longer use. And when that happens, we say that that cell has limited its cell fate. We can become an epithelial cell, for instance, and maybe we'll make keratin, maybe we won't, but we won't be making connective tissue stuff like collagen. Our fate has become limited. The more differentiated a cell, the more that its cell fate becomes limited. To the point, for instance, that the stem cells in our oral mucosa can only become keratinocytes. That's the only cell type that they can form. Now, once a cell differentiates and it starts packing its DNA around histones and storing that, the methylation pattern gets copied when that cell undergoes mitosis. So let's say this red epithelial cell has shut off green connective tissue genes and the green connective tissue cell has shut down the red epithelial genes. When these cells duplicate their DNA, the methylation pattern is also copied and this is passed on to their daughter cells. So the daughter cells will share the same fate. They too will only possibly express epithelial genes or connective tissue genes. Now, if we add even more and more cells, the cell fate is once again copied faithfully. But now something interesting can happen. Let's say the red cells release a morphogen that induces the green cells to turn on one of the different green colored genes that wasn't methylated. That red cell may induce one of the green cells to differentiate further. This organism has now just become more complex. We started off with two cell types. Now we've got a third. Next, is the process of morphogenesis. Remember to morph was to change shape. So morphogenesis just means the formation of shapes. Now over to the right, I believe are a bunch of dinoflagellates that look different, but these actually all share the same basic shape. They have little spikes that grow for a while and then branch into a certain number of branches. If that growth and branching pattern is changed, 
you could go from being this type of snowflake shape, maybe to this one, with more branches. But if certain branches grow at different speeds, rather than being symmetrical, you might instead look more like one of these down here. So all of these organisms actually share the same basic shape. The only thing that makes them have different overall patterns in the end or small changes to growth rate and branching patterns. So what this means for us is that the human body has certain instructions, which it will tweak a little bit to produce something that could have a very different shape, but is essentially the same type of structure. If you remember what hair follicles look like, please keep that in mind when you look at tooth buds. It's the same basic shape that these two structures grow from. And that's why they're going to share a lot of things in common. For instance, old hairs can get shed as a new hair follicle grows underneath it and pushes the old one out in a process of exfoliation. Many of our teeth will do the exact same thing with one key difference. They'll only do it once. So to summarize, the morphogenesis is the formation of new shapes. But one thing to keep in mind is that if we have one basic pattern for making a kind of shape in the body, we can tweak that to make a related shape someplace else. One more example arms and legs. They have very different jobs, but they have very similar shapes. They've got one bone that's proximal, then two bones as we go a little more distally, then four bones plus a thumb or big toe. It's the same pattern in the arm and the leg. We just tweaked that basic pattern a little bit to create a very related organ that has a very different job. Maturation is the process of taking all of your basic shapes and just making them look a little bit more adult-like. So morphogenesis was the formation of a new shape. Maturation is taking that shape and changing it a little bit. By week nine, all morphogenesis will be done. We'll have all of our basic organs in place. And then in the second and third trimester, it'll be our job simply to grow in size and allow those organs to mature into their adult forms. During early development, we will see a number of instances where two tissues minding their own business, grow larger and larger and larger until they bump into one another. And if they're the same type of tissue, they will often fuse together to form a single structure. For instance, our mandible actually started off as two mandibles and they grew together and fused down the midline to make a single bone. The frontal bone in the skull does the same thing. And if you go look in the mirror, and look at your lips, you can make a pretty good guess, I would hope, as to where individual structures started off and then bumped into one another and where they fused. And hopefully you'll notice that it's a different number of structures that started for the upper lip as opposed to the lower lip. When tissues fuse, if it's epithelial cells, then they may adhere to one another with desmosomes or anchoring junctions. But those same junctions can also help a cell attach to extracellular matrix. We would call that a hemidesmosome if it's just half of one. Next is the process of apoptosis or programmed cell death. This is a very important process in the growth of organisms. And it may seem weird that death is an important part of life, but it is. For instance, we don't grow five fingers 
from five individual finger buds. Instead, we grow flipper-like shapes. And if that's all that we did, then our hands might wind up looking like this over here. But that's what we grow initially. And then in a nice striped pattern, we will have regions of apoptosis followed by regions where there's no apoptosis. And as long as that patterning is organized properly, that should leave us with five digits. If we don't have enough apoptosis happening, and this is a very common congenital malformation, you might be born with webbed fingers or webbed toes, where all of the tissue that was supposed to be removed wasn't fully removed. So before I move on, I just want to reiterate how important that death is. It's a very important part of life. And I'm sounding overly dramatic just to impress upon you the importance of apoptosis. Because frequently, when we grow structures, we don't just build them from the ground upwards. We build a scaffolding, and then the tissue forms inside of the scaffolding. And at the very end, that scaffolding might need to be removed. That's going to be a very common occurrence in early development. So here's my summary slide of all of the basic processes that we're going to be seeing over and over and over again during the early stages of development. But up next will be the actual stages of development. Now it's on to the stages of early embryogenesis. You still have a chance to hit pause and make a quick flashcard for all of these processes that we just covered. These are keywords, and every time I say them from here on out, I'm going to assume that you know what they are. So it might be handy to have some form of quick reference because we're going to see them during the early embryonic period. And then we're going to recapitulate or do them again, maybe on a different scale as we form structures in the head. The first week is considered the pre-implantation period. It involves fertilization of an egg by a sperm, and then that developing embryo will travel down the fallopian tube to implant in the uterus. And this takes about a week. Fertilization normally occurs in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. And when a sperm fertilizes an egg, we would call that single cell with a full complement of 23 pairs of chromosomes, a zygote. And for the first week, that zygote is going to be undergoing a whole lot of mitosis, doubling the number of cells. It doesn't have a lot in the way of nutrients, so it's not going to have time to grow larger. We're just getting more cells. So as we keep going through mitosis, we're getting more and more cells, but the cells are getting smaller. It's important that during every round of mitosis, we double the number of chromosomes and then divide them perfectly in half so that both daughter cells get 23 pairs. If there is an error, in the division of chromosomes. This will usually trigger the cells to undergo apoptosis. They will not be allowed to pass a cell cycle checkpoint. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. Mistakes can be made with chromosomes number 21 and 23 and still produce viable cells that will develop into a, a viable human being. The first three divisions are called cleavage divisions because we can draw one line that doubles the number of cells on either side of that imaginary line. So we go from one cell to two cells, two to four, and four to eight. And each cell division occurs across a single plane but doubles the number of cells. After that, there's no single line that we could draw that would bisect every cell. 
cell division continues, but across different planes. So at that point, we just say it's a ball of cells or a morula. As the cells keep dividing and getting smaller, eventually a hollow cavity will form in the center. This hollow ball of cells we call a blastula. A little region within the blastula will migrate a ways to become different from the rest. The outer layer of cells, called the trophoblast, will ultimately develop into extra embryonic structures like the placenta and the amnion. It's the embryonic disk that I have blocked off in the red box that's called the embryonic disk. These cells will actually become the embryo. It's this stage that usually implants into the endometrium. And like any good little parasite, it will begin digesting away some maternal tissues, causing blood to fill up in that space and it will extract nutrients from that blood supply. Then we go on to the second week where the implanted embryo with its newfound source of nutrients will be able to actually grow in size and start developing some shapes. The first shape occurs during a process we call gastrulation. Prior to gastrulation, the ball of cells was just a ball. It didn't have a top or a bottom or a left or a right. During gastrulation is when we're going to start limiting cell fate. Cells will become different from one another. We will see a region of growth in one area of the embryo. All of these epithelial cells will divide a little bit more quickly than the rest and they will have to invaginate inwards. This is gastrulation. And this invagination is forming the digestive tract. We now have two different types of cells. They all resemble epithelial cells, but we've got an outer layer here and an inner layer of cells. These are going to form ectoderm and endoderm, which ultimately will become the epithelial linings of the outer surface of our body, like the skin, and the epithelial lining of all of our hollow organs, such as the lining of the digestive tract. At this point, though, the embryo not only has an outside and an inside, it's got a front and a back, or more accurately, an anterior and a posterior direction. That would mean that the first opening that we form is going to become the anus. The mouth will be forming much later. Next, some of the ectodermal cells will begin dividing and migrating towards the middle. That means they're going to have to detach from their friends. And when they do so, they are undergoing an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. The cells are no longer epithelial in shape or structure. They are now differentiated into mesenchymal stem cells. We're going to see this same process later in life, such as during the formation of the palate and teeth, and even much later during wound healing in adulthood. If you watched where these cells were dividing and migrating to become mesoderm from the surface of the embryo, you would notice that this process starts on the anterior side and moves in a posterior direction. It creates a small crease on the dorsal surface of the embryo that we call the primitive streak. Many of the processes that we're going to see from here on out start off from an anterior position and continue in a more posterior position. This primitive streak will also divide the embryo into a left and a right side. So now we have all of our basic directions. Gastrulation gave us our anterior and posterior, now dorsal and ventral, left and right. 
during gastrulation, epithelial cells of the ectoderm undergo that epithelial to mesenchymal transition to move in between the two original layers, forming the mesoderm. This tissue is called mesenchyme. It's a very generic connective tissue. The other two layers are epithelial the outer layer of epithelium and the inner layer of epithelium. And this pattern is going to be kept throughout our entire life. Both the outer surfaces and the inner surfaces of our entire body are lined by some form of epithelium. The only difference is the outer surfaces are derived from ectoderm and all of our inner surfaces are derived from endoderm. One question to think about though, in upcoming weeks, what about the oral cavity? Is that ectoderm or endoderm? And where is the transition from ectoderm to endoderm? At some point, our outer surface has to become an inner surface. So think about that when we get there. But for now, let's keep... For now, we're going to move on to the formation of our organ systems. Gastrulation gave us our three basic layers of ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. But now that I've got basic layers, we can start making the embryo a little bit more complicated. And one of the first things that occurs is a small region of mesoderm, uh, middle portion that we call the notochord, is going to signal to the ectoderm just above it and cause those ectodermal cells to differentiate and speed up their process of mitosis. So as those ectodermal cells become more specialized and divide more quickly, they will invaginate until they completely pinch away from the ectoderm, forming a separate tube. This tube is the neural tube, which will become the brain and spine. You'll notice that we lost a few cells in the process. They became detached from the neural tube and the ectoderm. They're going to be important too. But for right now, we just created one of our first organ systems, the central nervous system, which at this point is still a primitive tube. If you looked at this process from the surface of the embryo, you would notice that the tube begins folding from the anterior side and extends down towards the posterior direction. And it folds up and zips up into a tube. Now, the tube has trouble zipping up at the very head region because the head is growing extra fast. And so the actual zippering up will be a little bit slow in the head, but otherwise we generally fold up and zip up starting from the anterior direction moving towards the posterior direction. This is happening during the fourth week of embryogenesis. So this is very early in life. Those special cells that became detached from the neural tube are called neural crest cells. These will migrate throughout the body, becoming all sorts of different things. Some of the things that they become are relatively boring because, well, they're pretty similar to the nervous system. They'll become a bunch of different ganglia and our sensory neurons. But some of these neural crest cells, which again were derived from ectoderm and therefore are more related to epithelial cells, will go through some weird transitions to become more like a connective tissue. They're gonna become some interesting cartilages and bones. They also become our melanocytes out on the skin and other places. And we care about these neural crest cells because they're going to turn into the odontoblasts and the ectomesenchyme of the pharyngeal arches. These neural crest cells must undergo an epithelial to mesenchymal transition to do all of this stuff. Epithelial cells, remember, tend to be anchored to one another by anchoring junctions. So to leave the neural tube and go migrate to other parts of the body, you must first detach those anchoring junctions. So we remove some of the proteins in those desmosomes. 
And next, we start expressing digestive enzymes called matrix metalloproteases that help to digest other proteins that glue cells in place. And once we digest away the glues and the anchoring junctions, these neural crest cells can now migrate to distant locations to become cool things like tooth buds. The mesoderm will continue to develop and form somites at the same time. Initially, the mesoderm was just mesenchyme, just a big region of this primitive mucousy connective tissue. But that connective tissue will begin to coalesce into distinct ball-like structures that we call somites. This is not an invagination or a budding. That's what epithelial cells do. This is more of a pinching off. And these somites will form a number of structures that repeat over and over and over throughout the body. For instance, the somites will develop into our vertebrae, ribs, and some of the repeating abdominal muscles. Take a look at your six pack. Yep, the reason that we have a six pack is because each of those individual sections of muscle came from its own somite. So these somites being made of mesoderm make stuff that mesoderm turns into, connective tissue and muscle, including our vertebrae and ribs and muscle tissue. By the end of the fourth week, we're continuing to grow in size and some structures will begin to fold over. Notably, the head will begin to fold and become more prominent. Other structures will begin to bud and grow outwards or inwards. The beginnings of these structures, we often call a placode. If you can point to a spot that you're pretty sure is going to turn into something, we can call that a placode. It's just a bump at this point here where I've pointed to the eye placodes. So by the end of the fourth week, we've begun to grow most of our major organ systems, but they're still quite primitive. For instance, the eyes and the ears are still just bumps that we call eye placodes and ear placodes. The nose is just a bulge over here. The oral cavity is not even open yet. There's no mouth, just a region where we know the mouth is going to form. And the lower jaw is still a pair of lower jaws. They haven't fused together yet. We'll have an entire chapter dedicated to these arching structures that form a number of cool things. But that's the early stages of embryogenesis from fertilization down through the neurula stage. The last part of this lecture is just talking about what can go wrong during these early stages. Now, lots of things can go wrong during these early stages, but it usually triggers apoptosis and the death of the entire organism. In fact, about 60% or so of fertilized eggs never make it to the fetal period. Something goes wrong and the whole process just stops and the menstrual cycle can continue once again. But there are times where some mistakes are made and the organism continues to develop, which can lead to a congenital disorder or malformation. For instance, there aren't many times where errors in chromosome segregation can occur without triggering apoptosis. But chromosome 21 can have some mistakes made where cells wind up with an extra copy of chromosome 21, which we call the condition trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. This is not passed on to children, but they do inherit it from their mother, from the egg having an odd number of chromosomes. Older mothers are at a higher risk for having children with trisomy 21. 
Some of the dental hygiene related symptoms of trisomy 21 include microdontia, missing or smaller teeth, which leads to larger gaps between teeth, which makes oral hygiene more difficult. There's also changes to the airways and to the salivary glands, which leads to xerostomia, which again leads to challenges in maintaining good oral hygiene. Luckily, the saliva that is produced is more alkaline, which helps to mitigate some of the risk of having less saliva. In the case of trisomy 21, it was an error in meiosis that led to an egg with an extra copy of chromosome 21. And then that extra chromosome was going to be duplicated every time that egg, after it was fertilized, developed and went through embryogenesis. Therefore, every cell in those individuals will have an extra copy of chromosome 21. Other developmental disorders can occur later than the beginning of development. But generally speaking, the earlier that a problem arises, the more severe it will be. Because early in development, we're just a few cells. Something goes wrong with one of them. That one cell needs to become millions of cells. And that problem may be passed on to millions or trillions of cells. Many developmental disorders are caused by exposure to chemicals that interfere with morphogens. Those chemicals we collectively call teratogens. They either activate or block morphogen signals. And depending on when we are blocking these signals, the results can be greater or lesser in severity. One such condition is cleidocranial dysostosis, or CCD. In this condition, there's a mutation to a transcription factor. This transcription factor normally turns on the expression of morphogens that guide the differentiation of cells within bones and teeth. When mutated, it leads to changes in the size of the clavicles, and it leads to changes in the shape of bones in the skull. What both of these have in common and makes them different from most of the other bones in the body is that they develop by intramembranous ossification. They use a connective tissue model rather than cartilage. But of more concern to the dental hygienist is what happens to the teeth. The transcription factor that helps to guide the formation of bones also helps to guide the formation of the teeth. And it will eventually turn on an enzyme called a matrix metalloprotease, the same enzyme that we saw helping the neural crest cells detach themselves from the ectoderm and then migrate through the body. This digestive enzyme does a lot of other stuff. In fact, it is used to digest away some of the tissues that we need to remove to loosen up the baby teeth so that the adult teeth can push them out. Without this enzyme, tooth exfoliation is not possible. And as a result, those teeth will need to be surgically removed. The baby teeth and the adult teeth, if they can't push out or exfoliate the baby teeth, they will stay within the jaws and possibly become cancerous. So they have to be removed. And then this raises the need for dental implants or dentures, which of course is difficult to do on a child whose face is still growing in size. So you may need to wait until growth is more or less done before these implants are put into the jaws. Next up, we'll talk about stem cell therapies briefly. During embryogenesis, many of these cells have not fully differentiated. They may have made some choices, like to become ectoderm versus mesoderm. But if you've become mesoderm, you can still become any of the connective tissues, bone, collagen-rich tendons or ligaments, 
cartilage, adipose. You can become muscle. You can become blood. You've got a lot of options open to you. Your fate is still fairly broad. And by adulthood, cell fate of our stem cells has become severely limited, which means we can't really use stem cells from one part of the body to help repair another part of the body, unless we can trick them into going back in time and forgetting that they have limited their cell fate by adulthood. So one of the great promises of adult stem cell therapies is studying how these cells make the decisions that they do as embryos so that later in life we might be able to trick them into undoing those decisions and reverting to a more embryonic stem cell like state. This would then allow us to take cells from one part of the body, maybe some place where we don't need as many cells like our adipose tissue and move them someplace else and help them to differentiate into the cells that we actually need. Like maybe in the nervous system after spinal trauma or degeneration from Alzheimer's disease, or even maybe in the production of enamel. These are all hypotheticals at this point, but that is the interest of stem cell research. We want to learn how these processes occurred as an embryo so that we might be able to manipulate them in adulthood. Now, we should be particularly interested in the use of stem cells to help repair damaged teeth or gingiva. But currently, there's more interest in the opposite direction, using stem cells from the teeth to help treat other conditions. For instance, mesenchymal stem cells from unneeded third molars that have just been yanked out of the head might be useful in the treatment of neurodegenerative or muscular diseases. And there is some research currently ongoing in extracting those stem cells and transplanting them to these other tissues. Keep in mind though, that anytime you hear the word stem cell therapy, especially if it's part of an advertisement, it's probably bogus. In science, when things are stem cell therapies, we often don't call it that. Like a bone marrow transplant or a skin graft, we call bone marrow transplants and not skin grafts. Not a mesenchymal stem cell therapy for regenerating blood cells or something like that. If you'd like to read a little bit more about this topic, I've got a couple of good links for you here about the ethics surrounding stem cell therapies. But that's going to wrap us up for the early stages of development. I've got some study questions for you though, before you go. Enamel is derived from which of the following embryonic layers? Well, I haven't told you where enamel comes from, but it's made by an epithelial cell. So from that, you should know that it's not mesoderm. And now you just have to wonder, is it part of the outside of the body or the inside of the body? And in fact, enamel is derived from cells that come from the ectoderm. Next question, out of all of these, what might mesoderm turn into? Well, some of these are epithelial, like the lining of the stomach and the skin epithelium. We can quickly get rid of those. And the nervous system, we said came from ectoderm. So it's not that either. And enamel, also coming from ectoderm. So that just leaves us with the skeletal system as our last option. And indeed, yes, mesoderm turns into our connective tissues and muscles. And bone is a type of connective tissue. Next up, when do major developmental malformations occur? Is it in the pre-implantation, embryonic, or fetal period? The key word here is major. There can be malformations in the fetal period, but they're usually not as severe. And 
mistakes generally aren't made in the pre-implantation period, or I should say, mistakes are made in the pre-implantation period. 60% of the time, mistakes are made, and it leads to a dead organism. It does not develop with any sort of malformation. It just ceases. So major developmental malformations occur during the embryonic period. Next up, when does the face begin to develop? Well, I haven't talked about it yet, but it's not in the first week. We were still gastrulating in that first week, forming the digestive tract. And by weeks three or four, that's when we were forming our first organ systems, like the neural tube. So it's not quite that soon. So I think we're going to aim more for around week 10. That's still really early. What about the palate? Well, okay. We still haven't learned any of this stuff, but uh, it's not during weeks one through five because that's when we were doing gastrulation and neurulation. So once again here, we've got to go a little bit later than that. Not too much later. Next up, how are tooth structures produced? Is it appositionally or interstitially? Well, since the teeth are made up of mostly hard tissues like enamel and dentin, we know that those have to be made appositionally, one layer at a time. And the last question for you, what direction do things fuse? Well, anytime we're asking about directions, it's usually anterior to posterior. That's the most common direction. We will see some uh, other things that grow from the medial, uh, excuse me, grow from the lateral edges and move medially, but they will zip together. They won't fuse in a flat line. They will start from the anterior side and then fuse together more in the posterior direction. But that wraps us up for this chapter. We'll continue on early development with structures of the face.